And uh, I want to talk about, I mean, in, in a couple, about, about five, six years ago, people weren't using the phrase nature-based solutions. It was a very new phrase. And in fact, in many cases, it's still quite a new phrase. Um, and um, we were, I was fortunate enough to be linked to have led a large consortium of about almost 40 different partners across uh, Europe and also in Brazil, China, Korea, looking at how cities can renature. Basically, we're looking at not just regreening, not like putting lawns down, but renaturing, bringing nature back into the city. Now, some people now use the word rewilding as well, but they're kind of all in the same area. But I'll just talk about nature-based solutions because the the in we have with with nature, you know, to, to argue for bringing nature to cities is if it does a job for us. So if it provides a solution. So what I'm going to talk about is essentially looking at nature as a type of technology. So it's doing something. It's either, it, it, as I as you see, it's either uh, you know keeping the heat or the noise inside a building, or it's it's you know storing water, or um, I'll come to these slides later on, or we have different types of design, or it's, 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 it's insulating the building, or it's absorbing moisture, or it's, it's, uh, it's doing an actual physical job for us. But then during COVID, we started to get an awful lot more reports about people wanting to be green. I remember I was on, I was at, I got into a row on Pat Kenny with a lot of people who were phoning in saying, there's too, too many people in the parks, we can't keep, do you remember this, this mm -hmm. argument? Too many people in the parks, we can't keep social distancing, we should close the parks. Mm -hmm. And I phoned and I said, this, this is ridiculous, you know. So I said, the way I would look at it is, it's not that there's too many people in the park, there's too few parks for the people. Mm -hmm. Just turn that around, just, just look at it from the other angle. And then that makes it a much easier way to say, well, how do we address that? Well, other cities are doing this, so why not Dublin? And in some cases, yes, it's nice to have a park, but also, Green spaces, even if you're just passing by them, and green spaces indoors as well. This is Board, this is Board Bia just up the road. Uh, you know, indoors actually can provide that type of. The solution here would be stress, uh, air quality, mental health, um, just you know, enjoying your work. And in some cases, you know, people, buildings that have large greenery inside them, the staff turnover is low, and for companies, staff turnover is incredibly expensive. So, you know, it does have financial reasons. So, nature-based solutions can look like absolutely anything. You were mentioning the, the business uh, school just up the road there, and so on. Um, it all started, though, with the idea of what used to call green roofs. Mm. Uh, and you might have heard people talk about a green roof. Uh, in fact, the green part, the roof, the green part of it, is a plant that you might grow in your rockery. It's a stone crop, sedum. I don't know if anyone has it in rockeries. You can grow these anywhere in your, they will tolerate it. They grow in sand or cliffs, you know. And in fact, they're not really green. This is, this is the little, uh, they're up in sand, uh, in, uh, near Sutton. Um, it's red. So it goes red when it's had enough. That's it, I'm done. I've got enough. I'm just gonna, just not producing any more chlorophyll. I don't, I can't grow anymore. Um, and you, you can see that. And in the day gone, in days gone by, the idea of a green roof was like, maybe 10 years ago, if someone said to you, I'm gonna put a solar panel on my roof. Someone's coming to some money, you know, because you can have, you had to import them, and now you can buy them in B and Q. So the same thing happened has happened with nature-based like living rooms. It used to be very very rare, and only only like the odd company would do it. They'd bring a company from Northern Ireland to do it, or you couldn't get the plants from France or something. Now you can get them in B and Q. So that idea of uh, regularizing or making nature-based solutions. Uh, um, it work is, 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 is starting to become more normal. However, this is just another type of lawn. They're all the same plant. You know, they do flower, they do attract bees, and they are quite nice, and they do the job. They keep the heat in, they keep the noise down. Amazingly how quiet the, 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 the room below the roof with, the, with their green roof is compared to with just tarmacadam. And they also attenuate or hold on to water so they slow it down, like on a day like today, so it doesn't just gush out, it just slows it down and it releases it slowly. So they do a great job, but that's it. So Europe once wanted us to sort of look at the idea of how, how do we make nature-based solutions have more benefits, more community benefits, more social benefits, and more other, other types of benefits. Or they refer to them as co-benefits, not, not just a single benefit. Um, and so people started to identify ways of making them more biodiverse. This is in Switzerland. You know, you can see them where you can buy them. And, you know, yes, it does look like on new builds, but you can retrofit them onto old buildings as well. 
and you start to, you know, they're still in the same job, but they provide more biodiversity, they sink carbon. And, uh, but they're still up out of the way, you can't see them, right? They're still not really accessible to people. And, and that's the way it kind of should be for nature. People really want nature, you want, it just, you want it all by itself, not people trampling on it or dogs running around it. It's fine for animals and so on, but it does, it does give more life. But people start to recognize, actually, there's more power in this nature-based idea. And let's do other things with it. You can grow trees. These are olive trees growing on a roof. Um, now, I don't know if they're actually growing, to be honest with you, because I think they were just plumped in there. But uh, they're very proud of this. This is in, in um, southern Italy. And they're, oh, I think it is, or is it Tran? I can't remember what it is. But they're very proud of it. But you, you, might, you might have seen a picture like this. Do, do you know what this, this building is? It's an incinerator. So it's just like the thing we have down there. Except what this is, is a living roof that was put onto it um, to, to keep, to, like, to, to work, to do the job. But it's also designed that in winter it becomes a ski rod. And, and, um, and people love it. And look, look at the place it's in. It's in like our, their version of our Docklands. Exactly the same. It, it, it's exactly the same. Industries leaving, places being emptied, new apartments going up, you know, loads and loads of them. And, and you know, this is a free resource for all the people, and so they don't have to pay in it. You just get a little lift up, and then they use it. That looks a bit funny, but um, you know, and no, you wouldn't see it from the ground, but it looks, it, it looks genuinely uh, funny. But, so we've gone from the idea of just a green crop, you know, boring old crop, to something much, much more multifunctional, more useful. And that's why nature-based solutions in an urban setting are, are the winner. They've got a lot of a lot of potential gain. They're not saints, not there's 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 there are drawbacks to some of these things as well. For example, the more greenery you put into an area, the more the housing prices go up. <laughs> Green gentrification comes in. So we saw this in our, with our colleagues in Berlin, where they went into an area <clears throat> where there's a lot of migrants living in there, and they put in new parks, new solutions, and the landlords started charging more because you know they're new green places, and you know what's going to happen next. Then the poor people to move out to somewhere like. Here, or here, out in the boondocks, and then the richer people move into the area, and it starts all over again. So there's a, there's drawbacks to some of the, the nature-based solutions, but in terms of climate change, they do have huge impacts. This area doesn't have a rain issue; it's all about heat. But these trees actually can cool the air to such an extent that the cost of cooling the the restaurant down below is lower. So businesses can actually. Um, thrive in that situation. Yes, you have to pay someone to manage this, but it's exactly the same price as you'd be paying someone to manage your air conditioner. So the same, just a different company, but the same type of job, if you know what I mean, managing your air. Uh, the same with this, they have, um, this is a public uh, location, but they also can run private things as well. And, but it's also a place you can walk, it, it looks really small, but actually people walk their dogs in around here and all that. You don't have to ski if you don't want to. Um, we took students there, a couple, of, a couple of years ago, they're just finishing it and they hadn't actually got the green else. I'm just delighted to see the, the, the thing. But that's an incinerator, a waste to energy incinerator for, for rubbish. And I, I remember the original smell that used to be down here. I used to take students down here. And it's nothing like, there's no, I mean, it was nothing. It was fully functioning underneath it. The roof hadn't been ready yet. So things like that. And, and so we've gone from that to places where people can, can use them. So, you know, Yes, sport is important, but like you can have other types of areas here. And there we are down in Cork, where you can take the rooftop of a, a parking garage, which has a structure, the heavy structure that can tolerate a heavy weight, and you can use it to grow to grow crops. Um, for example, in, in Paris at the moment, they've constructed a like a shopping mall, which has got about two, about almost four acres of land on the roof that grows all the food that's been sold down below. And then they obviously import the difference, you know, but everything is so um nice idea um but the garden upstairs at the garden of the roof is used also as a park so people can walk in it like a like an arboretum so they don't eat the food <laughs> don't you know um and so it's it's become a multifunctional uh, idea so we've gone from a really boring green stuff and now we're putting roofs on other things uh, it, this is, is utrecht here where they've gone back to the sedum roof back to the old green um and i had a big Thing with the, the bus company that does our roofs here, our, our, um, our uh, shelters here, and I said, I said, look, we should do this, and the guy said, ah, no, we never, we can't do that, no, no, right. I said, you know, but you're the same company that makes these ones, they're exactly the same company, like literally the same ad shell, the same people make this, 
Ah, uh, no, we couldn't do that. No, we'd have to be people on the roof, like, messing with it. And I said, well, the people on the roof in Utrecht messing with it. But it's, then they get down. And then it grows up. It's not, like, it's not that they're up there camped all day long. Um, and then they're going from that into, into looking at, you know, bicycle shelters and all. The more diversity you do with this type of nature-based approach, the more companies you generate to manage them. So I was just saying before some of you came in that this is a way of transitioning, in not only making climate change the transition to the, the newer type of world, uh, pay for itself and, and actually keep the jobs that are there. So if there's companies, the companies that manage these, these are landscape architects or landscapers and so on, they now have you know more people employed to do the management of this. Because obviously, the more the plants grow, the more carbon they sequester. So it's going to be taken away, otherwise the whole thing would collapse. You know, a couple of tons of carbon need to be removed. But once it's removed, it's stored. That's it, it's soil. It's, that's it, it's, it's down out of the atmosphere. And you add all of these together, 3,000 of these bush shelters in Utrecht alone. You know, and there's one there, there's one down the street, there's one down there. So if you're a pollinator, if you're a bee, you can just about make it. Birds, definitely. Butterflies, ah, come on, they're not that good. But you know, <laughs> they can just about make it. But you twin that in with other roofs, and from the from from above, the city looks less grey and looks more green. But the two things then happen: one, in cities that are very high in rainfall, that slows the rain down, and cities that are very hot, that cools them down. So you can go from forty degrees. You see, you heard about the forty degrees in, in Europe. In a nature-based community, which has got some trees but also living roofs, that can go down to about thirty-two. You lose about eight degrees of temperature. That's the difference between life and death for some people. Certainly, certain age groups and people with different abilities, and certainly with any any chest illnesses, that's a big, big difference. So that makes the city more livable for certain people, especially in areas where there's maybe no access to parks. There's, it's just there's just nothing. There's nothing. So this is the way it's now. So then we decided we would try. Do you know what? Could we combine this with other sustainability ideas? So solar panels. And so we put this experiment, this is in the London Olympics in 2012. So we, we built this roof here on top of the media centers. It's about six or seven stories high above the ground. And it was originally just solar panels and then the green thing there on top of it. We didn't put all those flowers in, by the way. They just arrived in later. We've got frogs up there as well. Six stories high in the middle of nowhere. We actually, we don't know how they got up there. I suspect the caretaker. <laughs> two security guards come out to smoke every so often. But we don't know. They swear wine didn't do it for the kids, but like, you know. And um, anyway, however, the problem with this is combining technologies is solar panels work at high temperature, even in our weather. But this lower, remember it does the job, it lowers the temperature. So it looks great, but they're competing with each other. So they're not as efficient when there's greenery. So there's a bit of a you know mismatch. However, other researchers have gone on here in, in um, yeah, this is in the research facility in, um, in, in Tel Aviv. I'm oh, sorry, this is Tel Aviv, right, Mark? And they've, they've generated, made solar panels that are higher up than plants that can grow in the shade. So the plants you normally grow in the shade in your garden if you have one. Um, and so that's been, that's been quite beneficial. So, you know, it's one of those sort of technology racing things where they develop something, then something else is a problem, and they develop another thing, and then it leapfrogs each other. Um, consequently, you have your living roof. It's doing the job below. It's keeping the heat in. It's keeping the rainwater slow, uh, and and so on. Um, I'm just going to just check my time. Will you, will you just wave at me if I just wander off the point? Because I will wander off the point. <laughs> um, I, I would say the same thing for, for for living walls. But the difference with living walls, I don't say green wall. That's a green wall because it's one plant. But a living wall is lots of different types of plants. The way I, the way I see it. Um, and the living wall scenario, the difference between that is. They can see, you can see it on the street. Roof you can't see, unless you're in a taller building looking down on it, but the green roof wall you can't see. These are fantastic at keeping heat. This is a hotel in, in London, and we use thermal scanning here to show. You can see the heat escaping through the bricks here at, at, and at 26 degrees and 13 degrees, so like 10 degrees lower, so it's insane. And that's savings to the hotel. <coughs> this bit is just a decoration, but these two buildings here. So it actually, it, it, we have proof that they work, that the nature-based solution here works. And the only way they can manage this is by upsetting down, like, because you can't put a, a like a cherry picker on the ground because it's such a heavy traffic uh, area. So, <clears throat> and because it's heavy traffic, this absorbs all the pollution and all the noise. So this is what I'd love to see on Pier Street. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, this is what we should have. 
because it's one of the most polluted streets in, in Dublin, part of the country. And so this is what we should be doing in, in, in building. And you can do it with, you know, even buildings that are, you know, architecturally protected or, or legacy buildings. Um, this, you know, you can actually create these living different structures. This, this is an old, you know, this is about 200 year old building. It's very close to the Eiffel Tower. So it's in a rather kind of poshy sort of, you know, we don't want to change anything area. Um, you know, Elephant and Castle here in London, very old building, but they can, this, um, you know the Mason across the way, that's yeah, the inside yeah. of the Mason Hotel. Actually, that should be, an, actually, that's an in, I'm actually talking about outdoor walls, but that should be the next slide about indoor walls, but anyway, slipped in there. Um, but, uh, you know, so they can be done, you can take old buildings, and so you don't have to worry about, it. they're not growing up the wall from the ground, there's nothing in the ground here, they're in the wall. So if you have a special type of planter, like, a, like the plastic ones you get, but they're at an angle stick them onto the wall and gravity then feeds the water down through them uh, as, as where if it's necessary and then um, and and you can use a solar panel to pump it back up again and you can just once a week you can add your nutrient in and the, a little small device of this size can control the whole thing it's very very simple uh, even I can understand it it's very, <laughs> so it's very, and the same goes with this but the thing about these type of plants is the more diversity you have they kind of tolerate death See, the, you know, living walls, are, these are dying walls. Now, who wants to pay a fortune to have a dead, you know, plants that go to seed and start dying? I mean, the person who always knows that they will regrow from the seeds that drop into the soil here, that's fine. But, you know, if you think about it, at a certain part of the year, they may not be as good as absorbing noise or pollution. So, so these are not the perfect solutions, but they're much better easier on the eyes, I'll just be honest with you. I know it's nice to look at. I, I have chosen pictures. I mean, there are other ones that look rather bland. Um, just as bland as a brick building. But, you know, um, you could you could you know, do that. Um, and then we have, look, here we have Dublin Airport. They, they tried this idea. Uh, and airports are using this an awful lot because the noise level of it. So if you go to Terminal 1, stand there, and if you just if you stand in the middle of people and just listen, as you walk closer to it, you'll notice the noise level goes down. Um, and this is a uh, board B again. Uh, the door is made of moss, but this was these are all plants. Now, this was meant to look like the world. So Russia has invaded uh, most of Europe. Uh, or New Zealand there is doing very well by itself. Australia, well, that doesn't look good. So you know, America, Atlantic, and Europe have all become together, and Africa slowly disappeared. Because plants do what plants do, right? They they just change, and you know. Um, but in that office, it's a, it's a communal office, there's a big fight to have the desk nearest, the only door in, which would be, you know, if you're trying to work with people walking past one another, because the air quality is better here than at the other end of the office. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting, the benefits uh, of it, you know, the, uh, the, the co-benefits. This is one in Malta as well, which is very, very dry, but they, they've grown plants that are specifically able to grow in dry weather. It's a very old, it's actually like, um, Two buildings with the roof put over those glass roofs. You can join two buildings together. This was a laneway. Um, very, very useful, and and uh, it's it's actually people go in during the day just to kind of sit around here because it's it's cooler. It's physically cooler, even though the windows might be open above. Them. Uh, then we have this. This is another airport. This is this is Malta again, and this is plastic. So you might see that what looks like a living wall, but it actually turns out to be uh, plastic. So there is another type of greenwashing where you have this sort of fake mm -hmm. thing. It does, this, it does the job, it keeps the noise down a little bit. It's like having carpet on the wall, but um, nothing, like, nothing like the other types of benefits you get from it. So these are the living walls. Now, then you start getting into, you know, people designing them. Like, this, 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 these are, this is another living one. These are all, you know, very, very strong. So you have to ask yourself, is it actually doing a job anymore, or is it just a fashion icon? Is it just a, is it just a trend? Um, this won an award. This is I just got, got it off the internet. Like this is a very striking thing. The problem with this is, and I've been hearing this to a colleague of mine who lives not too far from it, is there's a lot of crashes nearby <laughs> because people can turn the corner and oh my god, that's not <laughs> And these these, these lampposts have been replaced, by, or this stop sign has been replaced four or five times because people hit it. So and the same happens in the um, that hotel I showed you. A lot of tourists are looking up in the morning and they just walk out of the road and there's been a lot of near misses and a couple of actual you know injuries. People walking out. So you know, 
They're not <laughs> beware. Yeah. Anyway, all that aside, I mean that's that's not any reason not to put these things in. But it's a it's it's become a, a, a kind of a, 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 a sort of an idea there that yeah, it's a little bit you know, is it really doing, is that actually doing a job for this building or is it is it just plumped and stuck on the outside? Is it like just a decoration, a big mural? In which case it doesn't really provide the solution it's trying to do. It has the aesthetic solution and make, makes the air quality nice. But I'm sure it makes the properties more expensive, you know. So there's a little, you know, a few drawbacks to that. And then we saw it in Chelsea in some of the, the big garden shows now. People are starting to really embrace the idea of it. <clears throat> but take away the cynicism, these are companies that make, you know, who do this. And there's a if there's a market demand right now, they're filling that market demand. These are companies employing people who would otherwise be maybe plastering the building or doing other types of building, but they're engineering focused. <coughs> And then the final solution I want to talk about, less glamorous, uh, this is in Glasgow here in London, are these rain gardens. Uh, it's, it's, it's these ideas where areas are deliberately allowed to flood. On a day like today, so I turn these ones in, it's, it's a perfect idea, a perfect uh, uh, day for, for it to see how one of these would work. Um, and, you know, on a normal day, they kind of look like this. But on a day like today, that would be full of water and it gradually sinks down into the ground. But you have other types of rain gardens that are very much organized and sort of, and we have it outside the Botany Building in Trinity as well. It's very, very flat. All the air is designed for water to go into the ground. I don't think it was originally actually designed for water to the ground. It's just maybe through neglect, that's what they've done. Uh, so I think it's more accident than design than Trinity's done. I can guarantee it's probably more accident than design. But um, in this situation, these, these, are, these are here for people's health, these are for recovery patients but they also serve the purpose of absorbing moisture into the ground so that the nearby uh, river doesn't get flooded. And you, I, you were talking earlier on about how does the community benefit from this. So this is Tower Hamlets. And I, used, I showed you the bicycle thing earlier on. And what they did with Tower Hamlets is, so what we did is, um, first of all, there's a park on one side of the road, and there's these are so, what you call social housing, corporate flats on this side of the road. And it was quite a busy road, traffic-wise, and people couldn't get into the park. And in fact, they locked the gate. So the only way you could get in is to walk about a quarter of a mile around to get in. So the kids would be climbing. You know you see people with carjacks to, to bend the bars so the kids could get into the park. You know that's a problem. So what we did is, myself and a couple of colleagues, we went down to, there was a football match on, I think it was Chelsea or something, and we robbed all the no parking signs for the guards. We robbed a load of them. And we put them at either end of the of the road it's and left them. I just left them there. Well, I saw yes, we, we yes, we, we bought them. <laughs> and we left them there. We left them there for like two months, and nobody moved them. And for two months, people, British people, were like, oh yeah, we'll go around the other way, <laughs> and they just left it. So then we went back to the council. We said, well, no one's using the road, so can we start putting in a nature-based solution approach? And they said, oh, all right. So mm -hmm. this, the water comes down from the roof into these rain storage areas, which they grow plants on top of. This, the, the, the pavement was replaced to be sort of like cobble lock, which allows water to go into it. It flows down into this rain garden, which absorbs a lot of water. Then it goes further up it, across. If, if it does overflow, it's, it's stopped at that side, but it's open. There's an opening there, so that open allowed in. And then it, it grows, then it goes into the park, and we put a new gate in. Right? So all the water coming off the roof is stopped, and it doesn't go into the sewage system, so they don't get flooding. And if they do get a little bit of heavy water, they don't get sewage flooding, which is what we get. We get too much water. Like there are parts of Dublin now today will smell pretty poor because after a while, that massive amount of rain will not be absorbed. So that's what I call a real nature. It's, it's, a, it's a double solution. And the extra solution we have here is we said to them, well, why they had a they have like a men's shed. And he said, well, what about um, managing these things? And it's not just this one, there's loads of them around the place. So they employed, they started their own company, a community, a kick, it's called Community Interest Company, CIC. And they start and they've got seed funding from the from the council. And so that they now manage, the community now manages, and two people are paid and paid full time and four part time. And then summertime it goes up to six and eight. And then they manage this and then the park next door. So, you know, I know what we were saying about like, is this gonna make a lot there's not a lot of people here. There's no website, there's no Twitter hand, like it's not you know, well known, but we do know that people use this and it's, it's very much. The other part of all this has got huge educational value for the for people who live here. A lot of, most of the people who live here are not from England, they're, they're migrants. And so this is a really good way of engaging with that 
community. So other work, there's a, a charity called Groundwork UK who work with them on this topic. So we have a much more uh, better idea of the co-benefits that this is providing. Um, so this is why we're not doing it. Like this is today, it's the Trinity. You know, I mean, you could just as easily convert this. Just take out, just take that out, a little bread, <coughs> and in you go. You won't need any flooding. Same goes for practically anywhere around here. You could, you could easily do that. Um, I don't know if you know Pellets Town, just over there by the back of the Phoenix Park, uh, Adams Town, Pellets Town, that area. And um, so these are these new apartments they built, and it's near the, the Royal Canal. Uh, but the Royal Canal is higher than the, the, the road here. So they put this fake river, this nature-based solution. So that if the canal overflows, it would all, it, all the water would go into there, <coughs> disappear down into the Talca, and that would be the end of that, and it'd be fine. But what they didn't do is they didn't say all the pipes coming off these roofs, which could just as easily also go into it, they go into the normal drain. And so they still have flooding. So what we have is the problem is not the, the solution itself, the problem is the silo of the thinking of the, the local authority and the planners. And, and this was a NAMA estate, you know, one of those ghost estates for a while. That's the, that's the other one that was now. That's being built now, and they have extended it through there. But then it comes to the end, and that's it. So this, you know, it's not, a, not literally not joined up thinking about it. Um, so what was I going to say there? Oh, yeah, so this, uh, finally then. So uh, I, I, this is a community called London Borough. This is Barking and Dagenham. If anyone's been to London, it's out where the Dagenham Works used to be. Forward works, yeah, that direction, just beyond the uh, the Millennium Dome, on the Docklands Light Rail, <clears throat> and it's a community. There's 87 different countries represented in that community, from all over the world, because they used to work in the works, um, but then those industries closed down. They still stay there, so they started a whole program of building. So these are all social houses in the area. These ones and these ones exist, and um, they obviously wanted to build them with sustainability in mind. These are solar panels. But they made a rule that, that the Thames just goes right past it. They said, right, you can do whatever you want, but no water, none of the water that flows from the roofs in terms of rain is allowed to go into the Thames straight away. But otherwise, you get all the pollution going into, like all the old asbestos and whatever they're built on, basically all the stuff they've got. So they designed all these different types of deliberately flooding rain gardens. Some are formal, like this one, and some are very, very informal, where they like little nature reserves. And what you can't really see here is this is a deliberate, that's a lake here, but it's deliberately allowed to flood into the, into the playground, just, just to the side here. Um, and, you know, it, it, it absorbs, so none of the water flowing off this goes into the Thames straight away. It's, they call it attenuated, it's held like a dam. And then it, it gradually releases slowly, so that all the silt, all the, the, the wood <coughs> just sits there, and it, only the water goes in. And so this is providing a huge solution for the water quality of that river, which is used by the polluted river anyway. <laughs> and they did this in conjunction with, further up was the uh, London Olympic site, and then further up again, there was another site. So they're gradually picking their bits in their city and stopping this from happening. So soon, you know, the Thames will actually be, well, you wouldn't drink it now. It's not get that far, but you would be able to, I wouldn't swim it either, but you wouldn't, it doesn't smell as bad. <laughs> yeah. So there's no miracle going to happen here, but it'd be a hell of a lot better. Um, and, and, and then just finally, so uh, this is, you know, this is the type of area it is. You've got social houses, you've got this, you've got this is a school here, and on the other side of the school is the, is the river, and you've got this big monstrosity going through the place. So, you know, it doesn't, it, 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 you know, you don't see the nature-based solution, but there it is doing its job. Now they put in a, the community wanted a fountain put in there, um, just for the laugh, I think. I'm not quite sure. It doesn't do anything, it just sprays and makes noise. Um, and the kids throw stones at it or whatever it is. But it's, 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 it's home to quite a lot of bits of wildlife. And it's very art, like it's very structured, you know what I mean? And on a warm day, people sit there, they have their beers or their, their coffee, and they just chat. And um, it's a fantastic community resource. But they don't realize, well, they do realize, because they, they were part of they designed it with the, the community. You know, they, they, there is, it's actually doing a job. It's actually it's holding the water there. And as the fire people said, because the fire pressure, the water pressure is quite low in that area, if there is a big fire here, they could just drop their hose into that. The way they, you know, the lake in UCD was designed specifically for that, that, that idea. So that's your nature-based solutions. And I just want to come on to that other project that, that you were mentioning, the ERC one, uh, called Novel Eco. 
um, which is uh, I kind of got moved on from the on from what I moved into it more into looking at nature and cities in more detail, and I started asking the question: Is well, this is one thing bringing nature in, new nature, you know, artificial nature or nature-based solutions. But what about the stuff that's already there? I and mean, we know surprisingly little about what, what plants are growing in the corner of your wall. You probably say, oh, that's no weed. Yes, but nobody knows what the distribution of that plant is, where it came from, and so on. And so I started looking at these informal wild wild spaces. This is this is where I live, just up in the Ninja coordinates. You don't see how you works, houses. Yes. That's where this is me. And it's, it, well, it, they stop spraying. They just stop spraying. They just literally come and came along. They stop spraying. Nothing there comes from Ireland at all. These are all, you know, blow-ins. I mean, in, 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 in the way they, um, and uh, there, there are their own little plant refugees. You know, there's a couple of poppies in it that might possibly be originally from this part of the world, but they just they're they're just you know in there. But they provide a huge amount of information to us about what the, what's going on in the city, but also. What I wanted to look at is what it is that people, like, does, how does it affect you? How does it affect people? What are your perceptions? So, um, and we are, we are currently halfway through the project. We've been doing a lot of work in, um, back here in Malta again, but also in London, in Melbourne. We have, uh, currently Natalia is in Copenhagen, uh, looking at, <laughs> she's near that incinerator, by the way, um, looking at the, um, uh, uh, there. And um, she then will be to go and working in Bogota in Colombia, which is where she's from. I said, oh, yes, well, home for Christmas, free flight, and then you can do your work there. So, you know. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I made a great stint there a couple of months ago in New York, when all the forests, fire, the smoke was in the city. Mm -hmm. And we were asking communities, um, you know, I think that no, nobody spoke English. So I was in because I didn't understand, but Natty, thankfully, she's Spanish, so she could understand. And we were asking people what they think about nature and, and what it means to them. And we find, we're finding that. This type of thing, color and shape, can can be much more relaxing than you might think. Even though you know, oh, I've got to manage that. There are bits of weeds. I've got to dig them up. Whatever. If you just put them aside for the moment and say, just let them grow for a moment. Let them let them do their own thing. Let them have their place here at the bottom of the wall. And I had a Spanish uh, student there doing Erasmus year all last year. She went all over um, the north part of the city. Uh, all, like uh, sorry, between uh, Thomas Street. Around that area, all the back down the back of Guinnesses and all the dodgy parts, God love her. <laughs> and um, looking and recording all the plants that were growing along there. And we found huge diversity of species, absolutely huge. But when she was, she didn't want to be disturbed, she's very shy, girl, but she, when she was doing her plan, people were coming, you're right, love, you get yeah. lost. Yeah. And she, said, she would say, no, no. And they'd say, oh, I love those plants. And people would start talking about them. Mm -hmm. And you realize that these are. What we call them, in, in, we're, we're calling these the, these types of ecosystems that are created by people that will never be returned to their original. We're calling them novel ecosystems. It's a very challenging and rather controversial concept in ecology. I love it because you know I don't care. I like talking about these things. And um, so these novel ecosystems, these places where there's no way it's ever going to go back to a forest that it was. It's part of a city now. So this novelty, what does it mean to people? And um, so far, we're finding some very interesting uh, perceptions. And we're finding a lot of artists are finding very interesting. We're finding a lot of communities. And we're also uh, looking at different, uh, different communities in different countries, but also different people of different, have I run out of time, different ages, because this is my last slide. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what we're doing, is we're going, we're creating, I'm in the middle, almost finished an app at the moment, mm -hmm. to allow people to take a photograph of your plant. But okay. before you upload it, hmm? name it. if you can name it, I think you get the gold star. No, no, I thought the app might name it. Oh, no, no, no. no, no oh, yes, I do actually. No, I, I have. It, well, it's going to cost a bit of printing, but you can actually try and search for the plant if you want. But I want people to try and name them first, particularly if it's a local name. It's a, if it's a, you know, some people have names or plants that they remember when they were a kid that we no longer use and that type of thing. But before you upload it, we ask about how you feel about your connectivity with nature and, you know, stress levels and so on. <coughs> so it's more of a social science. Um, experiment or uh, you know idea than it is natural science, but we, we in doing so we will then get a database of the plants that are growing in our cities. It's a global one; it'll be open to the globe, um, which has never really been done before. We don't have we've got little studies done in small churchyards or old buildings in Germany, or <coughs> you know little small pockets, or perhaps there's even ones where people have gone around, <coughs> like the Dublin Naturalist Field Club have done the canal. 
or they've done you know Holt Harbour or like a small little bit, but no one is reading randomly selected places around the city. And start looking at the, the places that you could say, God, look at that place. Someone should do something about that, get rid of all those weeds. And then before you get rid of them, let's see what they are. And let's see what they mean to people. I'm not, I'm not trying to stop development. Let's have to build, you know. The plants will always find their way. Don't yeah. worry about that. They're not, you know, there are, we know there's loads of endangered species around the world. These ain't endangered. These are the, you know, these are tough. These are bullies. <laughs> these are thistles. These will, these will grow in your ear if it's still long enough. You know, there's a lot of plants. So we're not worried about them, but in among them, we're finding little nuggets, little plants. And I don't know if you know the, you know, the, the wild spaces in Trinity, there where we found an orchid growing in it. Just we just let it go for, for a year, and all of a sudden it's a big hellebore, this beautiful thing that's normally growing on sand dunes. We haven't a clue how it got there. Absolutely none. Birds. And most birds, wind, you know, or, you know, if there was a, a former person in botany who might have just come and skip them. <laughs> yeah. But it couldn't have been because the only one flower if there's a fungus is so cool. So we, if it has to be, you have to do the two things. Mm -hmm. You've got to put a fungus in there and they don't even have English names, these fungi. So. Anyway, so that's sort of a, a whistle stop tour of the type of work that I'm doing, and um, but also the interest that I have in finding out more about what people think. We, we have a global survey of what people think about. We show some photographs, some of you know, obviously into core, because I just couldn't be bothered searching for other photographs. Um, some are people's back gardens, uh, things like that, and or, or things growing out of people's chimneys. You know, oh, yeah. you know those type of things, yeah. Udley and all that type of thing. Yeah. Um, and we're starting to hear an awful lot more from people that they're not really considering them uh, weedy species. They're considering them as, you know, they deserve a, a space for themselves. Um, now, the upshot of all of this will be that ultimately I should be able to show that, um, or go to the local authority and say, there's an argument here. Uh, first of all, your idea to give up spraying something, which is saving you loads and loads of money, which is great, um, is also got co-benefits. It's got different benefits to community that more people are, you know, say, oh, this is this is this lovely and growing up all by itself along here. It also gives you the gives uh, companies to say, well, can we artificially create this um, and to make it much more much more colourful, for example, or more diverse. And now we're seeing that in roundabouts and on roadways. You see them now. You know the round, like, and actually the new cycleway that goes up by Sheriff Street out mm. to Clontarf. You see them appearing along there, little small pockets. Mm. Those are informed by people, you know, local authorities, people in the local in the, in the community saying, "We like some of those weeds. Mm. We don't mind them." And we do have a problem with some cities where they tried to increase the nature in there is it brought animals in that they didn't want in the city in the first place, they deliberately tried to get them out because they carry diseases. Mm -hmm. So some animals like um, like, the, the, like biting midges and so on, that those type of ponds would not suit. So that pond with the, with the, the what you call it, the fountain in it, they came along and they put goldfish in there because they eat the mosquito larvae. Mm -hmm. I think they put the midges for the laugh, but they, they, they do the job for them. But you know, so you know, the, the more you green up a city, the more, you bring nature in, but not all nature is desired. Mm -hmm. And we're okay here. But if you're in places like Calcutta or in some of the you know the more tropical parts of the world where when the more nature you bring in, they have a problem with, for example, with monkeys um, mm -hmm. that would, would can pass on diseases. And we know that coronavirus is probably a disease that passed from an animal. Now not not the same way, but you know, mm -hmm. they worry about that. So there are issues about things like um, zoonotic that type of disease. That comes in, or just in general, animals we don't like the look of. So, how many people like these gulls that we're all talking about? Mm -hmm. See, you know, all of a sudden, it gets very personal. We start talking about rats and gulls, and you know that type of thing. But if I was to tell you about, you know, some very, very unusual animals that are dotting on that, that's lovely. They're very cute and lovely. So, when does an animal stop becoming cute mm -hmm. and starts to become an absolute? Get that out of my kitchen. There's an extreme we can go to, but you know. So, there's one thing we can do is we bring nature into the city. But the, thing, the second thing we, we have to do is bring nature back into people. So that's the idea of connecting, reconnecting with nature, connecting people back. That idea that we're separate to nature, we feel separate to nature. That we, you know, even if we, like, I don't have anyone, if I say the word spider, then anyone run out? Yes. I have, okay, I've seen that happen, right? And I've seen, like, I just say the word, and all I need to do is do it to my brother all the time. I just say, Gareth, there's a spider behind you. He'd be gone. <laughs> yeah, I know. But I, I do this for the laugh, you know what I mean? But, um, 
because he runs out of the pub, he can grab his pint and he's just like, but But that's just, but I mean, it's the same with a few other cities. Paris is an example of that, and, and Berlin, not the German. Um, Vienna is a, is, a, is, a, is a city like that. It's a very old buildings. How are they going to put, I and mean, Athens, how are they going to put nature into places where literally you put a spade in the ground, it's archaeology. Mm -hmm. You can't dig. Mm -hmm. So we have to innovate. We've got to put things in mobile pots and move them around. We've got to develop ways of growing things uh, in, in, um, in, in structures. I just want to quickly flash, flash back to the very first slide. I'm going to show what I mean. Yes. <coughs> These type of things. Where we, we design this using Lego. Where everything grows in the thing, nothing grows in the ground, and you just assemble them like Lego. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can make a place like this, is Ludwigsburg, where it gets to 40 degrees in the summertime. And in that area there, it's about 33, 32 degrees. Mm -hmm. just, and there's no roof, it just cools it down. So that's all artificial. It's on top of a, a car park roof. Um, that, and they put some grass down recently, but that's our, that's, that's, that can be taken up and moved around. So that could be around a building site, for example. Yeah. And when the building's finished, you leave it. Or you could just change the shape of it. Mm. You just take it up. That's literally, we, we got the idea up and rolling. His, his, uh, a few. We had a dinner at the end of the project. And I said, would be mad? Would be mad if you, I also said, would be mad if you put that in the back of a truck. And so we've now got, um, we've got about 30 of them made that, to go around Germany and Austria, showing people what nature-based solutions are. <laughs> so that's the innovation. Anyway, that's, that's, that's the type of thing, you know, and you can, you can innovate with it. So whenever you need soil, um, so yeah, the idea is that if you had a, an, a green, you don't need a green party for this. This is just normal thinking. Uh, it, it, is, it is very, very possible. So I just want to say thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Really, you could sit here all night yeah. and talk about this. There yeah. is also um, an initiative called Greening Pier Street that I'm sure mm -hmm. you, at least some of you know about. So there is also work, there, there, you know, there's a group of businesses, including Trinity, and anybody who has an interest in Pier Street, all actually working together with the council to try and put a plan in place to create these stepping stones, natural stepping stones for our pollinators up the street, and just to change the look and feel and sound and air quality yeah. of the street. So that work has started, and hopefully we'll start to see some changes there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.